because you can't process that cotton if it's got all them seeds. So what Eli Whitney did was, and he 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 wasn't even a farmer. He was just uh he was like a tutor for one of these uh, slave masters' son, and he was like, well, let me think about it. And he came up with a little box, and he he had this little uh, gadget that would feed the cotton into the box, and it had these teeth that kind of intersected, and, and this little crank would pull the cotton through those teeth. And we think what happened to all them seeds, now, ping, 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 they'd all shoot out. And that way they were able to process a lot more cotton, and that resurrected, unfortunately, the slavery industry, but them British were happy because they had a lot more raw cotton to make uh, clothes and stuff and dresses for all the pretty ladies. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Lives of rural textile workers. Um, okay, so obviously cottage industry is uh, kaput, right? That, that's German for broken. Why? Because it's obsolete. Because it, you can't have all these big machines like right up in your living room and stuff like that. So everything gets uh, transferred or shifted down to the river, right? And so now nobody, these farmers and landless peasants, they got to make a decision. What are you going to be? You're going to be a farm hand or are you going to work down at the factory? Uh, you got to choose, all right? So the jobs were there and those were full time, tw you know, all 365 days a year. Whereas if you're going to be a farm hand, you know, that's seasonal work, you know. And so if you want something consistent, you're going to probably go with the, uh, you know, down at the mill with the textiles. So what 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 the, the farmers would do is, you know, they got to go. They got to go. But the, see, they didn't like it. It didn't work out. It was real hard because they had to show up every day at a specific time. All right. And these are farmers, man. They don't have clocks. They get up when the what when the sun comes up and the the doggone rooster starts crowing in the middle, you know whatever whatever time he does. So they're not like real punctual. So they're always showing up late and uh, they're getting punished and they're getting their wages uh, docked. And so they didn't like that. And plus, the the nature of this work, oftentimes they were not really controlling the machines. They were just monitoring them. And if they like run out of supplies, they'd have to fill it up. And like if they get jammed, they'd have to you know fix it on the spot on the, on the spot. So, but they had to be there all the time, like 10, 12 hour shifts. And I mean, these farmers were not used to that because when when it, it was the cottage industry, heck, man, they had to run a household too, and it was the whole family was involved. So if you know they get tired or something, they could take a break and go, I don't know, go down and do some fishing down in the pond or something. But working in a working in a textile mill, it, it was real hard for these uh, rural workers to do that. First off, they're showing up late, and then they got to stay 10, 12 hours a day. But one thing was nice. The father, he would basically, he was like the boss of his family, right? And so he would work directly, like form some kind of, a, you know, a agreement with the, with the factory owner. And, and so he said, well, I got three children and I got my wife and we're going to come in and we're going to work together as a family. And that was fine. And, that, and, and that way the father, um, could kind of oversee his children and hit and be with his wife. And so even though they're working 10, 12 hours a day, they was doing it as a family. And so it wasn't like horrible. So not only was the family a social unit, but the family was an economic unit as well. So that's kind of interesting. All right. Oh, you want to hear a fun fact? Y'all know what swaddling is? Swaddling. You swaddle a baby. All right. Thank God you guys don't have any children yet because you're only 15, 16 years old and 17. You don't need to be having any children anytime soon. But when you become a mama or a daddy, you're going you're gonna to have to keep an eye on them children, all right, them babies. Uh, they crawl everywhere, okay? And, uh, you know, they don't have daycare back there in the 1700s. They can't, like, you know, take them and drop them off at uh, Karen's kids and they're going to wash their babies for them. They got to take their babies with them. And could you imagine, you know, you got all this machinery going, and you got this little uh, toddler. What's that toddler do? See, I used to take my son to church and hit that boy. 
for like two straight years. I, I don't think I ever heard what the preacher said once because I was too busy chasing my son around because that boy got into everything and he was so full of energy. So I could just imagine what my son would be doing if like I had to take him to work with me when he was a little baby. Oh, he'd get in all kinds of mayhem. So anyway, what, tell him, oh, when you threw the toys onto the altar and embarrassed me and I had to run out there and get, yep. So the one thing, because you, I mean, you get, you know, all this machinery, the baby would he'd probably crawl, Henry would probably crawl into the uh, machine and get, you know, strangulated with all the yarn or, I don't know, worse, something, something could happen. But so what the mamas would do to try to make these babies not, like, get away, <laughs> they could, like, trap them, they would tie them up and they take a blanket it's called swaddling all right and like you tuck their arms in okay like you know what a mummy looks like it's kind of like that or um what i like to think of it is is a little baby burrito okay you take the baby and you put the blanket out and then you tuck his hands in and then you put the blanket around and you tie it here and shove it here and that doggone dog baby he's trying to get out and he can't and he starts screaming, but that's okay as long as he ain't getting loose. That's called swatling. And doctors, it's big controversy today. Some doctors say that's torture to do that to your children. Well, not torture, but it probably ain't a good idea. But I did it to my babies, and they just fine. Ain't nothing wrong with them. Um, but doggone it, when, they, when it's time for a nap, it's time for a nap. And I ain't got time for them crawling all over the place, so you got to put them in that... You know, you gotta, shh, you gotta tie them up sometimes. You gotta tie those babies up, all right, because you don't want them getting all uh, hurt by the machines. All right, so there you go. Uh, spins, yep. So whole family was a social unit, but also they was an eco, economic unit. Let me look at my study guide, make sure we see where we're at. I'm having fun. Isn't this fun, guys? Okay, so yeah. Number 14 says, what is pictured in document H? What conditions led to its creation? Yep, we got that. All right. Now, uh, we we just about ready. How did, yeah, number 17, how did life of the landless peasant change from the time of the cottage industry to the birth of the factory system and then again in the second generation of the modern factory? And that's where I'm going right now. Okay, so something's going to happen in that second generation of factories. Okay, so here it is. Um, when, when the, uh, machines become a little bit more fancy, all right, uh, what the factory owners begin to realize is they don't need, um, like, you know, the man was a weaver and he had a lot of skills, all right? Well, the machines kind of, I guess, reduced the need for having somebody that had a lot of skill, okay? And so what ended up happening was they, they slowly start getting rid of the men for these positions. Now, they would, like, maybe promote the man and he could be the manager or something like that. Um, and, and oftentimes the man would just go into other industries and, and maybe, you know, become a, uh, an apprentice of some sort. And but who, who was left, all right, was the woman and her children's. Okay, and so the factory owners specifically targeted women and children for employment because they knew that they could get away with paying them less. How tall is that child? Well, he's about half the height of a man. Okay, well, we're going to pay him half wages. And that's kind of how it went. So now daddies are no longer with their babies and their wives. And so the families are getting split up. And now those... Um, like managers and factory owners, see, they, they they wouldn't mess with the daddies, all right? But now that the daddies are gone, they start whoop, they start taking the whooping those uh, children, all right? And they start knocking them around and mistreating them for, you know, maybe showing up later, uh, falling asleep at the job and, you know, uh, I don't know, not being productive enough. And they try to do the same thing with the women, all right? And so what we see with that second generation is the the family unit as an economic unit is fractured. It's no longer together, all right? And so it's going to kind of be pretty bad for a while until uh, probably another 100 years. Okay, we're almost finished here. Now, okay, another invention. Okay, what did I say about the streams? 
uh, the mills and the factories located by the rivers, right? Inefficient because it could flood or it could drought. So there was an invention, okay? And it was called a steam engine, all right? And this steam engine completely revolutionizes uh, the factory system, all right? And it was like the best system um, for a long time, all right? So this is how it all came about. They were making iron, okay? In, um, they were making iron in England, okay? And this iron requires a lot of heat to, uh, to, to melt it, right? And to uh, process it. Well, they, they done cut down all the trees in England almost. So what they had to rely on was coal, okay? And there was plentiful, because it's a lot of natural resources, but pretty soon they start getting um, all the coal that's on the surface and they gotta dig, 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 like my, my, my old dog Gia used to do in the backyard. She'd just dig, 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 dig. And she dug, one time she dug straight down all the way to China. And came back with a bowl full of rice. Yep, she sure did. Okay, so, but you, you dig, 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 okay? So if you're digging in the earth and you get to a certain spot, you're going to tap into what's called the water, the water supply, okay? The groundwater supply. And, and these little mines, because that's what they call the coal mine, will fill it with water. And all your men would sail away or float away and they drown. And that's not good. And the equipment and all that's so with the, they had to figure out a way to get that water out of there, all right? Now, you, you know, you tie a rope or a bucket to a rope and do it that way, but it, you'll never get it done that way. So this feller, uh, guess what? Thomas Newcomen, all right? He's a, uh, I think this guy. Oh, he's English. Oh, what a surprise. So this Englishman figured out a way to uh, develop a, a pump, a pump system that would draw that water out. Uh, Any time it filled up, okay, and it, and it was uh, controlled by heating uh, a cylinder, okay, and so they fill it up with coal and it burn it, and inside the cylinder was the water, okay, and that water would get heated up and it would create pressure, and steam would begin to drive these cylinders and operate the pump, and next thing you know, you got water coming out. Like you ever make macaroni and cheese on? You turn a, a burner on and you, you go away, put the lid on. Next thing you know, it's boiling all over. It doesn't mean, it happens to me about every single time. Okay, so this guy, Thomas Newcomen, came up with this um, get, this invention, all right? It was, uh, it, was, it was a steam engine, okay? And this steam engine um, was not very efficient, okay? So this next guy, guess what? He's not an Englishman. He's Scottish. Well, James Watt. But he's from the same doggone island. Anyway, uh, he came, He studied Thomas Newcomen's model of the uh, steam engine, and he improved upon it, okay? And got a patent for it, and he had a business partner, and they were able to um, sell this and market it to people all over the place. Not only were they were factory owners, but to also coal mines, because this did a better job of pumping out that... Uh, of water than in the, the Newcomen model, all right? So what what they figured out pretty quick was you could power uh, machinery in, in the same way that the water mill, see, look right here. See this? This is a little wheel right here, all right? And it's got these gears and this little belt here, and that's exactly the same kind of setup that they had down at the water mill. But... This time, you can put that factory anywhere. It don't have to be by water. So if it was you and you were going to build a factory, where would you put it? One of two places. You could put it to where the people, the like your workers are, like so maybe a city, or where the coal is. So by a coal mine, one of the two. And in England, they did both, okay? And so as a result... Where we see coal mines and cities, we also start to see the birth of all these modern factories, okay? And coal mine and uh, factory production just explodes, all right? And we start to see the industrial revolution. It really starts to heat up, okay? And, and the other uh, industry, one more industry that really drove things, and that was iron production. And this guy, Henry Court, came up with a new way to 
uh, blast heat through iron ore to burn out impurities. And what that did was that made the, uh, the iron much more pure. We're not quite to steel. Steel production will come at the end of the like 1870s, 1880s. But this, well, I mean, it could make steel, but not cheaply. But anyway, so we got coal and iron. And this are two, these are two natural resources that England's got plenty of, but they, they are huge industries, okay? And what we see here are, these are canals. And canals were private, uh, like, enterprises that merchants would pay uh canal companies to excavate and uh control the uh water supply so that people could use the canals to, for transportation but they didn't have steam engines yet back because this started back before the steam engine was even invented so what they would do is they would have these little canals with little barges little boats and and alongside the uh, on the shore there'd be a horse and and he'd have a you know the the rope to the barge and, and he'd pull it and that's how they did it for a long time but what's coming what do you think's coming eventually they're going to come they're going to figure out that that steam engine and now we got all this iron there's we can we can make a new type of a uh, uh, invention that would improve upon the canals and and take that same basic principle of the steam engine that's right it's going to be called a locomotive all right the locomotive all right so anyway um i think i already did all this when i was talking about the working conditions okay um now it just talks about how back on the farm how how the cottage industry used to work and um Yeah, I think we did all this. All right. Yep. Long days. Unskilled worker. Children get abused. Yeah, I already did all this. I think we're done. Yep. That's it, boys and girls. All right. So that's the Industrial Revolution. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Have a great night. Bye-bye. I got to feed my baby's dinner. See you.